I'm not gonna lie, I'm super terrified of this subject, but somebody's gotta cover it. And so here it is, what to do if you're married to a jerk. Abigail was married to Nabal before she was married to King David. And uh, God doesn't always just kill a jerk. In that case, he did, but uh, sometimes you're stuck with him. And what do you do? But before I go any farther, I want to explain who I am not talking about. First of all, I am not talking about a physically abusive man. If you feel like your life is in danger, because of the person that you are married to, I highly recommend that you contact authorities and people who are and people who have a specialty in that area to help you get to a safe place and to get established. Because God cares about you and he cares about your life. And if you look in the Bible, he always gives an exemption for the sake for the sake of human life. When you look at the midwives with the Israelites and Pharaoh said, kill all the babies, and they didn't. They delivered the babies and then they said, oh no, the women are just so strong and these babies are just so fast. And God honored their faith. And if you look at Rahab and how she lied to save the lives of the two spies, God honored her faith. Your life and your children's lives are important and if you are in danger, if you fear for your life, seek help. Please seek help. Second, I am not talking about a husband who is involved in adultery and is unrepentant of their adultery. When I say adultery, I mean porn addicts, people who are having affairs, who are stepping out with an sundry amount of women. It doesn't matter. If your husband is involved in those types of things, the Bible says that if a man looks upon a woman to lust after her in his heart, he has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And I know that that's an addiction. I know that there are a lot of people who are trying to get out of that. And so if your husband is repentant and he is trying, or if he's had an affair and he's repentant and he's trying, God has so much grace and so much mercy and there can be restoration. There's just so many people who have had restoration and wonderful marriages, those scenarios. But if your husband is unrepentant, God says, except for the cause of adultery or fornication, you know, you stay with them, but that is a clause where they become one with somebody else and it breaks that spiritual bond and he gives you freedom and liberty to move on. Third, I am not talking about a person who's just passively not living up to their spiritual obligations. Somebody who's not as good of a provider as they should be. Somebody who's not as good of a nurturer and admonisher in the Lord who doesn't have a heart towards the children as much as they should. A spiritual leader, the one who's had given the one who's taken everybody to church and involved in family devotions, and a husband who really honors you and cherishes you as the weaker vessel. They could be doing so much more and they could be doing so much better and they're passively failing in their God-given responsibilities. I'm talking about somebody who is actively cruel. They lie to you or about you or to your children or they antagonize you on purpose. They provoke you or your children to anger and then they turn it around and blame it on you as if it's your as if it's your fault. Those emotionally manipulative people who twist everything that you say to make it untrue and then blame you and accuse you. They say awful things and then they deny it later on or they use aggression to intimidate you and make you fearful or they manipulate your situations to where you're constantly walking on eggshells because you don't know when they're going to come at you with some verbal aggression and they are actively, purposefully cruel and manipulative and hurtful. My heart goes out to you women and I know a few of you who have really, really awful husbands. And yes, that is emotional abuse. And I don't always understand the ways of God, but I can see what he says. 
And in 1 Peter 2 and 3, he talks about that forward man. And he doesn't say to leave them. God's answer is for you to be faithful to God and to try to win that man and save his life, save his soul, save his eternal judgment by you. You are going to live your life with a single purpose, only to God, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as a servant to God Almighty, who loves you and who will honor you for your sacrifice. But the thing is, it's, it's, it's in here. How do you do that? How do you survive in here? I'm going to read this. 1 Peter 3.12 For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. This works hand in hand with 1 Peter 2.23 where Christ is our example. And he committed himself, even though Jesus was innocent and was treated cruelly, he committed himself to God who judges righteously. First and foremost, you really need to strengthen your relationship with the Lord. Because if he is the one that you're going to obey, and if he is the one that you are going to serve, and if he is the one at the end of your life in eternity when he looks to you and says, well done, thou good and faithful servant, well done, the world was not worthy of you and your sacrifice as you obeyed me beyond all of your understanding, and that his his ears and his heart and his eyes are towards you as you live righteously. And God does see the evil. And God will judge that righteously, whether here on earth or in eternity. Trust that God is a righteous God. In 1 Peter 3.14 it says, Be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. And in 1 Peter 3.15 it says, Be ready to always give an answer to the hope that's in you. And that just means that in spite of your circumstances and the world looks around you and says, I don't understand. I don't understand how they could do that and still have hope. And yet, as you come to know God personally, and I believe you ladies, you ladies, I have it easy. I do have a wonderful husband. I have a wonderful marriage. I don't understand the depth of what you go through, but God can see it and the world will see it and he will help you to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. But that strength, that mental strength that you need more than anybody else, what a brave and a strong woman to dig into God's word and to really pray and seek his face and seek his truth and find hope in him so that when somebody says to you, I don't understand how you can do it, you can say, let me tell you. Let me tell you how I can do it. Let me point you. Let me point you to the friend that sticketh closer than a brother and giveth, gives you the peace that passeth all understanding. God's ways are not our own. So find hope in the relationship with God. Find hope in the justice of God and find hope in the promises of God. And you need to read your Bible. You need to find where he has promised you strength. I think about Psalms 103 and the daily benefits that he gives us. And I think all throughout the Psalms of the promises and the hope and the understanding and the compassion that he gives to us. But if you aren't in your word daily, if you aren't seeking his face, and if you aren't pouring your heart out before him, you will have lost the well of resources, the only resources that can help you overcome what's going on in here and to be strong and i'm not saying to be the perfect wife and walk on those eggshells so that he doesn't get mad at you i'm saying in your own i'm saying in the strength of the lord and in the strength of your mind you make decisions because those are your decisions 
because you know what needs to be done. You aren't being manipulated. You are choosing out of a position of strength. So you need to find hope, but then you need to develop a sound mind. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. And that goes with that meek and the quiet spirit of trusting God that He will take care of you in spite of your circumstances, that He will take care of you. And He will be able to ease those fears if you, as you take everything to Him in prayer. You know, if you keep your heart and your mind on Christ Jesus and on the Lord and look at the big picture that He is the master builder and He has and he is the composer of an orchestration and he knows your part and he knows what you're going to play. And he is there leading you and guiding you. But only if you lean not upon thine own understanding, only if you acknowledge him in all your ways. James 1, 5, that if you lack wisdom and you ask him and you seek his face, he will give you the wisdom that you need to make those purposeful choices. You need to... You need to get involved in truth. Read his word, yes, but find people who know truth. Biblical, godly people who know truth and can see whether these accusations that are being cast at you have some validity and maybe you do need to work on something, or are they complete lies and this person's just goading you for their own sick pleasure. So keep track of what is truth. Keep track of what are lies. You need to develop a sound mind independently of that relationship with your husband so that you can serve God with your own mind and not live in fear and doubt and manipulation. You need to flee youthful lusts because Satan is out to destroy you. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about eternity. He doesn't care about your husband's soul. He doesn't care about your children's soul. He doesn't care about the lives of people who could be changed by the hope that is found within you and the life of your husband if he does eventually submit to the Lord and he is won over to God by the conversation that you've lived in fear so that God's word be not blasphemed. Satan doesn't care about any of that. You know what he would love? He would love for you to leave your husband. He would love for your children to lose faith in God and in the power of God and in the power of the relationship with God. And he would love you to fall in love with somebody else besides your husband. He would love for your home to be completely destroyed in generation after generation, right after you, to fall off, to, off the bandwagon. Because if you fall, why, why can't they? If God failed you, why wouldn't God fail them? Flee youthful lusts. Be careful. Be careful of any relationship you would have with any other male. I don't care if that male is married or not married, a co-worker, a friend, a Facebook friend. I don't care who they are. You, especially above all women, you need to guard yourself because you have a void in your life and Satan would be happy to fill it with something else. Lastly, Commit your works unto the Lord, and your thoughts shall be established. Look at 1 Peter 2 and 1 Peter 3 and see what God says. Who They didn't render evil for evil, railing for railing, accusations, and who threatened not. That Jesus, in whose lips there was found no guile, contrary-wise, there was blessing. Love your enemies. Do good to those who despitefully use you and persecute you. This is the way of Christ. As you follow his example, he wasn't all about him and what he wanted. He was willing to suffer wrongfully for God's glory, for souls, for those around him. And that is not how our culture is. That's even hard for me to, to understand or believe but I know it's true because God's word is true. My heart, I know I'm a little bit emotional because my heart goes out to you. But I know you can be the virtuous woman regardless of your situation. The Bible says that she did him good, talking about her husband. She did him good, not evil, all the days of her life so that he could trust in her. 
there's any hope for your husband, it's in you. And it's in the Lord. And it's in your strength and walk with the Lord. I'm going to go now. I hope this was a blessing. I hope this was a help. Have a great day.